Morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. And welcome to the latest in the Tax Analyst series of discussions on key issues in tax policy and tax administration. Today's topic is the challenge that states face in taxing cloud computing technologies. We will discuss how states are approaching that challenge and what they should think about in doing so. I'm Chris Bergen, the president of Tax Analyst, which is the nonprofit publisher of State Tax Notes, State Tax Today, <coughs> Tax Notes, Tax Notes International, and many other fine print and online products on federal, state, and international taxation. We are in our 11th year of public discussions on tax policy. If you are new to our discussions, let me say it's great to have you here. Let me take just a moment to explain our process today. I will open things up with some brief remarks to introduce our topic. I will then introduce our distinguished panel of speakers. Each of them will address aspects of our topic. After that, we will open up the discussion to all of you, and we encourage all of you to participate. We are streaming live video of this event on our website, and that explains the camera in the back of the room, so I want to welcome our virtual audience as well. Next week, we will post both the webcast and a transcript of today's event on our site, taxanalyst.com. For all media purposes, we are on the record. Tax Analyst has a few reporters in the room. For that reason, when I recognize you, please tell us who you are. Once I call on you, we will quickly get you one of our handheld mics. We are also tweeting this event at hashtag cloud tax as we reach more people beyond this room through social media. We invite our listeners to send us questions via Twitter. Just one tweet at the hashtag cloud tax for dinosaurs like me, that's one word, with no space in between. We hope to hear from you all. I will moderate the discussion and we will end at 11. Now on to the topic at hand, state taxes and cloud computing. We often hear that government traditionally lags behind developments across the society that it governs. It's slow to respond effectively through laws and other measures to basic social and economic challenges like crime and poverty and hunger. And that it's slow to respond to far more technical challenges like how to tax new and complicated business transactions. This problem of government lag time certainly applies in the area on which we're focusing today. Most states are now just figuring out how to tax digital products. But as they are doing so, businesses have since discovered the benefits of the cloud, and they are adopting it for their convenience. Businesses are beginning to feel more comfortable with some form of cloud computing because cloud vendors are addressing the security vulnerabilities that are inherent in cloud technologies. Now, think about how state taxation has evolved when it comes to computer technology. In the 1990s, as the internet grew more popular and more businesses went online, Companies bought software or downloaded it and installed it on their computers. They paid sales and use taxes on the purchases. Even though the purchase of a download lacked some physical features, states concluded that, in a legal sense, companies possessed the software once they had downloaded it. That may seem a bit confusing at the time, but compare that to what the states now face when it comes to cloud computing. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, defines cloud computing as, I quote, a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, parenthetical, e.g. networks, servers, storage, applications, and services, close parenthetical, they can, that, that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction, end quote. To a dinosaur like me, that's like the first day of tax one. And it's quite a mouthful. NIST further specifies that cloud computing has five general characteristics. On-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity, and measured service. Okay, I got that one a little better. The cloud infrastructure includes both the hardware and the software that's needed. The hardware includes the servers and storage and network components. The software is what you and I think of cloud computing. Now, here come the states into this complicated mix. As we all know, state revenues still have not recovered from the shellacking they took during the Great Recession and its aftermath. States are now looking for revenues wherever they can find them because they need to balance their budgets, 
or they want to restore some cuts in programs that they were forced to make, or because they want to finance tax cuts. So why not tax the cloud? Good idea, except that states don't know how to do it. That is why they haven't updated their tax systems to account for new technology known as cloud computing. After all, the cloud operates in, well, the cloud. It operates in a borderless environment. If there's no physical location, then which state gets to tax it? Should it be based on the location of the user? What if that state chooses not to tax services? Or let's say that the state where the servers are located will tax the cloud. Won't the providers of cloud computing simply relocate their services to states in which their tax bills will be lower? And could the users of cloud computing find themselves taxed twice due to different ways that different states decide to tax the cloud? A lot of questions. To examine all this from multiple sides, we have an absolutely terrific panel today. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Kara Griffith, to my left, is the Editor-in-Chief of Tax Analyst State Publications. Kelly Miller is an associate with Reed Smith, LLP. Mark Nebergal is President of the Software Finance and Tax Executive Council. And Dylan Wade is Managing Senior Policy Council with the Washington State Department of Revenue. Thank you for being here, all of you. Kara, can you get us started? Sure. So cloud computing is all the rage. And uh, my husband, who is an IT professional, he rolls his eyes at me when I say that to him, that it's a big thing. And, and he will insist to me that cloud computing has been around for decades. And we're sort of only now hearing about it, in large part because uh, businesses are finally, as Chris mentioned, they're jumping on the bandwagon. They're really sort of starting to, uh, to appreciate and understand the benefits of cloud computing and feel comfortable using it. But what is the cloud? It's not a, it's not a really, it's, well, it's not a place, and it's certainly not a singular place any more than the internet is. The cloud contains thousands of servers located at data centers. And those servers, which are located at a variety of locations, can be harnessed on demand and run tens of thousands of applications that are accessed by individual users. At any given time, there are literally millions of users accessing applications on the cloud. So I thought to frame a discussion of cloud computing, let's take it back and think about how, how we run an application on a single computer. So assume an individual, they go to a big box store, they purchase a copy of MS Word. They go home, they install that on their laptop, and they are legally authorized to use Word. But to actually run the program requires a certain amount of resources. The laptop needs to have an operating system. It needs to have a processor and memory. It needs to have some means of storing data and managing the computer systems. And it needs some sort of input and output devices. It's the combination of these resources that makes up the platform for which the application actually runs. The same basic resources are required for an application to run in the cloud with the major difference being that the resources are not contained in the laptop, they are contained in the cloud, and therefore can be located anywhere. Now there, of course, are additional resources that are needed to access the cloud. There needs to be a network that will enable the user to access the resources that reside in the cloud, and users must have a computer to connect to that network. And so because of that, because it needs to connect to the network, the computer must also then be able to network, access the internet and have networking capabilities of its own. So to sort of generalize, in non-IT professional terms, for which my husband might still frown upon me, cloud computing differs from traditional means of accessing business applications in that cloud computing encompasses off-premise, on-demand computing. So while traditionally businesses had to purchase hardware and software and then have it configured and maintained on their own servers, with cloud computing, a cloud service provider can provide both the software and the hardware necessary for an application to, uh, for users to access an application via the internet. Most cloud services uh, offer cloud computing in a form of shared hosting or software as a surface, SaaS. But these are not the only service models. There are three different types of service models and each of which are sort of have an implication in our tax world. SaaS is probably the most known and arguably from a tax department standpoint, most understood service model. SaaS enables uh, customers to use a provider's application via the cloud infrastructure. The applications are accessed either through a thin client inter interface, uh, which is sort of like a web browser, or a program interface. And we all have used SaaS applications. 
web-based email, calendars, photo applications. There's a, a large array of SaaS applications. So SaaS really provides customers with the application, the data, the accessibility, the storage, the network, but the customer has a very limited ability to control the underlying cloud infrastructure. Now, Platform as a Service, as a service or PaaS, provides customers with fewer features but more control. I think a lot of businesses are kind of moving towards PaaS because they have a little bit of additional control. The PaaS service model enables customers to deploy on a cloud infrastructure applications using, um, I should rephrase that, they can deploy applications, their own applications, on the cloud using tools, languages, services, or libraries that are provided by the cloud provider. So in essence, they come up with the application and deploy it onto a hosted uh, cloud. And developers write the application, upload their cloud into the infrastructure, and then the app is hosted uh, and scaled. Google App Engine is perhaps one of the most well-known PaaS <coughs> providers. Now, infrastructure as a service, which I ask, is that mm -hmm. going to be? OK, I was not sure of that uh, pronunciation of that acronym. IaaS allows developers the maximum amount of control <laughs> when interacting with the cloud infrastructure. The IaaS model allows businesses basically to outsource the equipment they need uh, to support the cloud infrastructure. The customer gets to deploy and run their own software with IaaS, and they have some level of control over the underlying uh, operating systems and the deployed applications. Now, Clouds can then be further subdivided into public and private clouds, and, and, and really it's very much like it sounds. A public cloud is a shared cloud with shared resources. Anyone can get to the cloud um, and use, that, use the application for its various purpose. Developers that deploy applications on the cloud, however, have very little control over the cloud's underlying infrastructure. Services are simply provided as a service with a public cloud. The private cloud, which it seems from looking at some, uh, some research that was done, are being widely used by businesses at this point. Uh, and like the name implies, they are private. They are clouds that are uh, set up for a certain organization, uh, and only certain users will have the ability to get into that, uh, that cloud. Now, there are some differences in, in who, uh, who maintains the clouds, which sort of gets to the point where private clouds are going to be more expensive, uh, but you're going to have more control over the maintenance of them. So this takes us to the tax treatment, which I'm going to touch on briefly and then happily turn, turn it over to our, our wonderful panel here. States are now trying to impose sales and use tax on cloud transactions. I'm going to limit my discussion to sales and use tax. There are some uh, income tax implications for cloud service providers, which is, is kind of a separate thing. But the problem that we're having now is that states have to use their traditional sales tax laws and traditional sales tax analysis to try and fit it into cloud transactions. So the first we're going to look at Nexus. And if Nexus is found, then is the transaction taxable? If taxability is found, then where do we source it to? And this is all a very traditional analysis, but the characteristics of cloud computing really make it quite difficult. So let's look first at Nexus. In general, until it is otherwise changed, a taxpayer must have a physical presence in the taxing state before it may require uh, the collection and remittance of sales tax. For cloud vendors, this means they need to be really cognizant of where their footprint is and really understand the services they are providing, as well as, as the, the positions that states are taking in terms of a physical presence. Because, as we're sort of all aware, while Nexus used to require the presence of property in the state or the presence of in-state employees, that bright line standard has is, is really been quite eroded. Uh, and, and sales tax now, Nexus now can be created by a much more tenuous connection. We'll click through Nexus, the potential for federal legislation, which is, potential, is probably unlikely, but they really need to be aware of it. And then even beyond this, that's really sort of the tip of the iceberg for cloud vendors. They then have to think about, so they have this physical computer system, but it can be located in any number of states. So does a cloud vendor have Nexus in each state 
in which a computer server is located? Does the cloud infrastructure itself create nexus? And then customers, and more likely the end users, because most are businesses of those customers, access the cloud from any number of locations. And particularly now that we all have smartphones and tablets, we can access the cloud from virtually anywhere. So some of the locations of these end users will be readily available and easily seen to customers, and, and others won't. So it's this sort of amorphous nature of cloud computing uh, that really creates a lot of questions during the nexus determination. But let's assume that nexus is found. The next question is whether cloud computing transaction is taxable. Now that determination turns on whether a cloud computing service model can be classified as tangible personal property or a taxable service. And states are not uniform in their classification of this. Now computer software is subject to sales and use tax on the theory that it is tangible personal property. But while cloud models have an element of software, they really aren't. It's, it, the cloud computing transaction is very different from the traditional sale of software. And when you think about it, businesses aren't really, in their mind, they don't feel as though they are purchasing software. What they really feel like they are purchasing is the assurance that when someone clicks on their website, that it will function every time. So from that perspective, cloud computing transactions really are not the sale of tangible personal property. If anything, they're the sale of a service. But then, is it a taxable service? Sort of the debate continues on that. I'll let our, uh, our wonderful panel debate that and more. Uh, so then the final, the, the final piece in this is once nexus and taxability have been established, then how should the sale be sourced? Now, sales of tangible personal property are sourced generally to the state in which delivery occurs. Sales of services are much more complex given the debate over the performance sourcing versus cost, or versus cost of performance versus market-based sourcing. Now, a lot of the issues with sourcing are not unique to cloud computing. These are, it's the service debate uh, that is a very, very difficult one. But for cloud computing, the difficulty really stems from the lack of any physical delivery. Uh, the cloud vendor remains in possession of the computer system. The customer is simply deploying an application on that system. And another piece that is very difficult in terms of sourcing is that cloud vendors use resource pooling. So that means there are, are a number of servers are, are very likely located at different data centers, could be in different states, and they provide services to customers on a non-dedicated basis. So that means when a customer deploys its application, it has, may have no idea the server that is being hit and the location of that server, uh, it could be in any, any given location. So resource pooling may prevent states from being able to source to the location of the server. But sourcing to the location of the customer may not be a viable source either, a viable solution either. As I already noted, a single customer with a business is really the end user. So we have salespeople that may be traveling, we have multiple locations, and we all have our, our laptops, our tablets, and our smartphones, so we could be accessing the cloud anywhere. So perhaps the simplest solution is to source to the location where the customer is located, but using a single predetermined set, a predetermined location, which would be billing or headquarters. But still, just because that's the easiest solution doesn't mean that's the one that states are going to choose. Uh, there's actually, a, I think the trend, and, and everyone else can shed light on this some more, would be to using the location of the actual user. Uh, as with all issues, there will be outliers. I, I think that's a very difficult uh, to, to find where the actual user is. is is going to be very problematic and difficult for, for states. Uh, given the lack of guidance that states have provided to date on this, taxpayers may find some protection in following sourcing rules outlined in the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement. Although the agreement does not mention cloud computing, there are certain rules for sourcing computer software, and those may, if the taxpayer follow those, follows those rules in good faith, provide some level of protection on audit. There's no doubt states will continue down this path of taxing cloud computing. It is a, going to be a very, very difficult road 
um, sales and use tax is really predicated on the idea that there is a location, whereas cloud computing is predicated on the idea that location is irrelevant. Uh, expecting cloud computing to fit neatly into <coughs> existing sales and use tax laws may be a bit of a pipe dream. And with that, I will.